Okay, so in this video, what we're going to do is take a look at excitation, ionization, and then obviously from that, look at or well, de excitation and calculating the energy of photons that are emitted. So let's start at the beginning. What exactly is excitation and ionization? Well, in the diagram you can see on the screen, this is what we call a Bohr's model of an atom, as it shows the electrons in different shells. So first off, let's talk about ionization. Now the definition of ionization is, basically, is when you either completely remove or you add a new electron. But in terms of this topic, we're only going to focus on removing electrons, okay? So, ioni so ionization will be taking one of these electrons and then taking it all the way out, completely out of the atom. Now, atoms don't like having their electrons stolen from them, so they put up quite a lot of resistance to doing this, so it actually takes quite a large amount of energy to, uh, to ionise it or remove the electron. Uh, but the energy it actually takes is what we call the ionisation energy, and in like later slides I'm going to use the notation E subscript I to show how much energy it would take to remove an electron. So that's ionization. Okay. Excitation is not quite as extreme as that. What excitation does is it takes an electron and moves it up to the next energy level in an atom, or it can skip multiple steps. So if we take one of those inner shell ones and move it out too. Those are all examples of excitation, because what the electron has gained energy, but it stayed inside the atom, so that's called excitation. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to look at another diagram, which is a bit more helpful when we're thinking about that. So, okay, let's move on. Okay, so a more helpful way of representing the different energy levels is in a diagram like this, where this, say, at the bottom is what we call ground state. Okay, and this is the lowest energy state that an atom can be in. And what we do is we assign each of these levels what they're called quantum numbers. So we always assign ground state n equals 1, and then you just go up in order. So the next one up will be n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, and so on, depending on how many shells your particular atom has. So if we look at the arrow labelled number 1, what we can see is that an electron has gone from ground state to n equals 1 state. So you can clearly see that it's still inside the atom, because it's still at an energy state in the atom, therefore the transition 1 must be showing excitation. But what you can see the next, the arrow 2, is an arrow going the opposite way. So it's going from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. In fact, it's going down all the way to ground state. And that's what we call the excitation. Oh, that's some horrendous spelling there. My apologies for that. The excitation. So that's what's being shown by our arrow 2 here, because it's going from a high state to a lower state. And the reason for this is, when it's an excited state, that's actually a more unstable state. Because the ground state is the most stable an atom can be, and atoms always want to be really stable. So if they get moved to a high energy state, and we're going to move on to look at a bit later how they, that actually goes about happening, what you find is that they'll then try and go back to the lower energy states by this process called de-excitation. And to enable them to do that, what they actually do is they take the extra energy they've gained and they emit it as photons. Okay. So, and depending on the change in the energy from when it moved from the high to the low, that changes the photon energy that is emitted. One of the things is, so let's do another excitation line here. So we're going to go 
Oh, we're on the right hand side. Let's draw another excitation line going all the way up to the n equals 5 level. Now, when it's at the n equals 5 level, it has lots of different options for de exciting. It can go all the way back down again to that level. It can take an intermediate path, so it can go down to n equals 2 and then down to 1. It could go down to n equals 3 and then down to 1. You could go to n equals 4, then down to 1. You go to n equals 4, then to. Sorry, n equals 3, then to 2, then to 1. It can take all different possible paths, which is why you can get lots of different photon energies being emitted when you start to excite atoms. And again, we're going to move on to look at a bit more specifically how things get moved to these higher energy states. But it's important to be aware of that lots of different photon energies can be reduced. Now the last thing I want to look at on this video slide is to draw your attention to this arrow here, the number 3, labelled on your diagram. Now the key thing with this arrow is it's actually not actually possible. You can't move electrons to somewhere in between levels. It just doesn't work like that. Electrons can either go, in this situation, would either go to 2 or get enough energy to go to 3. It can't go to a level in between, and this becomes important later on when we're discussing methods of excitation and methods of ionisation. Now, if we look at this diagram, obviously what we might be interested in is, well, what's the ionisation or energy of this? And obviously the ionisation energy will probably be way off the top of this diagram because the ionisation energy is normally quite a considerably big number. Okay. So let's get into the detail for things. Now what we want need to be able to do is to calculate the, the energy of the photons emitted or calculate the amount of energy required to cause ionisation or excitation. We need to know a couple of key equations. So let's have a look at this one here on the left. So what this tells us is the energy at, en at the given level in the atom. So you saw me in the previous diagram label the levels n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, etc. And that's what this n is here on the bottom of the equation. It's actually the quantum number of the level you're looking at. And E subscript I, as I mentioned before, is the ionization energy material. And that's something you can look up in lots of books, obviously. These things have been investigated, and that's a property you can look up. So by using those two values, and obviously this negative sign here at the front, you can calculate the energy of an electron at any given quantum level in the structure. And that's actually really useful. Because say we've excited our atom to the second energy level. So we want to know what E2 would be. Well, it would be the ionization energy, and obviously we've still got our minus sign in there, divided by 2 squared, so that's obviously minus over 4. And obviously the energy at ground state is simply equal to the ionization energy divided by 1 squared, obviously minus the I over 1, which is obviously just minus the I. And this is quite useful because if you want to work out the amount of energy emitted in a photon form when an atom de excites from the level 2 to the level 1, we can take our photon energy equation. Obviously, the energy of it is equal to HF. And obviously, you can see from the equation up here on the right hand side, the photon energy is equal to the difference between those two energies. That's in this case, it's going to be. The, at the second level, so minus EI over 4, and then we're going to subtract from it. Right, so you end up with a photon energy actually equal to 3 quarters ionization energy of this particular atom. So that's quite useful because maybe you want to design structures to emit certain wavelengths or certain photon energies. By using this, it allows you to pick 
the kind of atoms or the kind of materials that you want to use, say if you're doing a fluorescent light bulb for instance, when you want to emit in the visible spectrum, that sort of thing, using this allows you to calculate the energy of the photons so then you can calculate the frequency of them which you can then see where it is on the spectrum. Okay. So I said earlier I was going to talk about the various methods for causing ionization and excitation and there are two different ones which I'm going to look at in turn. So the first one is you can cause excitation or ionization by the collision of an electron. And what this means is say we've got our atom here, this is a very rough sketch. So we've got our atom here and what that means is we've got, we've got an electron coming from outside coming into the atom and what happens is there's obviously electrons in the shells in this and it can collide with one of the electrons let's, let's draw the shell, it can collide with an electron inside it which can cause it to move to a higher state or even if, it, if the electron has enough energy it can cause it to move out of the atom completely and become ionized So what's governing what's going on here is that your total kinetic energy before, that's the kinetic energy of the electron that you, that was in, that's coming into it. So that's the colliding electron, is that. And then obviously that kinetic energy is transferred into two different things. I'm going to bracket those off. Firstly, in terms of describing the excitation, so the energy gets used to move the electron up an energy level so, or obviously it can move it up two energy levels or three or whatever but so some of the kinetic energy from the colliding electron is used to move it up to a higher level or even ionize it completely and, but if there's any energy left over that gets left with the colliding electron and then that electron then will obviously move away and it will still have some kinetic energy so it still gets left with some kinetic energy okay so one of the key things to draw your attention to here is the colliding electron doesn't necessarily need to have exactly the right amount of energy to move up the levels it just has to have greater than the amount of energy needed to either excite or ionize it any spare energy can be left as kinetic energy and that's going to be an important difference later on. Okay, so let's move on. The other method. So what the other option is that you can cause excitation or ionization by photon absorption. So there's a couple of the key principles you need to look at. And I'm just going to summarize them out on the, this side. The key thing, one of the key things is that you'll have actually in fact learned about earlier in this topic is that photons can only interact with electrons in a one-to-one -one ratio. So one electron can only interact with one photon. So that's quite important because that means that photon must only by itself have enough energy to move an electron up an energy level or if you're trying to ionize it have enough energy to ionize that electron. But the other key thing is obviously you don't, in this case, compared to what we had before with the colliding electron, we don't have any mechanism to deal with any spare energy in this. So what you actually find is that your, your photon must have exactly the same energy. as the excitation or if you're ionizing it, the ionization so we see here on the top left where I've written the equation so you're the, basically the change in the energy of the electron in, a, in the actual atomic structure must be exactly equal to the photon energy but if it's not the photon will just just pass straight through the atom and not have any interaction. You only get the interaction when it's exactly the same amount of 
energy as the energy change and the energy change that it would cause. And that's quite an important difference between the two possibilities. So we can cause excitation and ionization by this photon absorption method, or we can do it by colliding an electron with it. But I guess to take this back to what we we're looking at before, once either of these processes have occurred and you've got an atom in an excited or an ionized state, that's unstable, so the atom wants to become more stable. So to do this, it then de-excites by emitting the photon, and that photon energy is obviously equal to the energy change, and so we've come right all the way back round to the start again. So we're back. We'll be back to looking at our energy diagrams, and it's looking at exactly what we were describing earlier.